before we get into it today, I want to tell a little story. Um, back in 2004, was that when we started college? Yeah, 2004. Yeah, so. Some of us, not all of us, but some of us, um, were at SCAD. I was a film and television production major, and... I was at an art college, and in art college, they make you take something called fundamentals, which is just basic drawing and shit. And as an artsy type of kid, I would draw in my youth. I would draw Chucky Finster from Rugrats to try to get attention from girls. I would draw Batman to try to get love from my father. That was about it. And that was the extent of my artistic skills. Then in high school, to try to once again get attention from girls, I went into film and tele- or well, video production, doing the AV kid thing. And the coolest thing that I was able to figure out to do, and folks listening at home that do this shit on your fucking cell phones right now, don't understand how mind-blowing this was in 2004, but I was able to make a music video to the band Ra, the song Call My Name, and I had... Michael Myers and Ghostface chasing me around my house and killing off my friends. <laughs> and at the end of the music video, I didn't know how to end it. So what I did was I cross-faded them into nothing. They faded away. I overlapped two shots, one with the, the killer there and one with the killer not there, not having moved the camera. And it blew the fucking minds out of <laughs> everybody who saw it. How did you do that? Oh, my God. Look at all the special effects. I was king of the mountain. Then I go to fucking art college (laughs) where I'm thinking, okay, I submitted a portfolio. I'm good enough to be here. Then I start going up to something called critique. And these people are putting up fucking Rembrandts and this crazy drawing shit that was way beyond Chucky Finster or this overlap transition shit that I had put together. I felt like a full-time fraud until, until... One day in, I believe it was 2D design, uh, we had I think we had got assigned some kind of an assignment about uh, a color palette. Uh, it was something to do with like doing a monochromatic color palette. Now, I'm still at the point where I'm learning about the words contour, and I, I'm going to butcher this word, chiaroscuro. It's like the Italian word for shading. I don't know if I used it right or not, but who you knows? You probably did, yeah. <laughs> Let's say you did. But I... Didn't know what to do, and for some reason in my dorm one day, I saw a tube of toothpaste, a comb, a toothbrush, a mirror, and a faucet sitting in front of me. Shit that fucking college art cool school kids draw when they're bored. It's like the boxes that everyone makes 3D and and like before they draw that S that everybody draws in their notebooks. Um, it's the equivalent of that in art school. But for some reason, I saw it, and I saw it in my head. Just being blue toned and not like regular blue, but like a aqua icy color blue. And so the assignment was to do it in monochromatic and I was at a loss. I was so confused. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know if what I was doing was right, whatever. But I did it. I said, you know what? This is what I'm seeing and feeling and this is what I'm vibing. I'm going to do it. And I did it and I presented it to the class for critique. And for some fucking reason... I hit the lottery that day because the Rembrandt and the Picasso kid were put to fucking shame by my tube of toothpaste that was just in different shades of blue. And so for this week's episode, we have two very special guests on, along with my usual co-host, Mr. Matt Rainwater. We have Matt the Joker joining us again, and we have Mr. Joe Bevel. And we are talking about trusting your instincts when it comes to creating your art now i'm not talking about being successful like even in the critique form i'm just talking about being successful in terms of your own what you're trying to accomplish with your project or whatever i brought you two guys on as a pairing because you guys bring two different perspectives for um well when i say i brought i I really mean rainwater brought because he did all the arranging (laughs) this week but (laughs) i thought i thought you guys would be the good pairing because of two reasons number one um, to me, Joe, when you do music, that is a kind of abstract thing. 
And that when it comes to like things like abstract art, you really got to trust whatever's going on in your head to be making sense and to be able to communicate with people. And I want to joke her on too because of what uh, the original episode we had him on for too is because this dude is so fucking cultured. He's seen so many things that so many of us haven't seen and he exposes it to us that at times, and this is just, I'm just speaking for me here, when I'm doing things in my art, I will stop and frequently question myself as to whether or not I'm doing something original or if I'm subconsciously ripping off something that I've seen before. And so we're going to start with Joe, but I want you guys both to kind of talk about maybe those aspects of approaching art from an instinctual standpoint. So Joe, when you're coming at something like a music, how how much does instinct play a part in what you're doing like where you want to do something different or something abstract that maybe you haven't heard before or you've heard kind of in a song but then your brain is interpreting it maybe slightly than everyone else's like can you speak to how your instinct plays in creating music so yeah i actually have um an older project that was based around the idea of instinct and kind of just like going with my first intuition it's the one called ghosts on my soundcloud but I kind of did that back then because I'm a naturally, like, indecisive person, you know? And so I was like, I'm never going to do finish anything if I don't get faster at <laughs> just making <laughs> sure. choices. And um, but what I found, though, is uh, something that opened it up for me is that there's only so many chord progressions, right? Like, there's a handful. And I can send you a playlist of, like, just one. Uh, there's a classical song called Pachelbel or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, but there's like a million songs that follow that same chord progression, right. and you would never recognize them. Like a DMX and a Green Day song have the same chord progression. Wow. And so I basically like I worry less about that now because I know that like everything we're taking in, that's forming what your instinct is. Like instinct isn't like I'm pulling something out of the ether and like making a choice. Like all your experiences and all the stuff you take in, like that's kind of helping you choose so like the choices i make are always going to be different from like you guys because we have different experiences now there's definitely overlap right sure. but like you know i feel like i'll make this you know certain kind of choices that other people wouldn't so i just trust that interesting so now joker yeah. that we're going to pivot to you and i'm curious to know when you're drawing i mean obviously Anyone who's driven a, drawn a straight line, and this can also echo into you a little bit, Rainwater, but anyone who's drawn a straight line doesn't question, oh, man, am I ripping off somebody else who's dr drawn a straight line? But, like, when you're when you're coming up with, like, story content for certain things, and I guess Joe can speak to this, too, because he works in some comics and illustrations of the three of you, but, like, when it comes to, like, storytelling, um, it what, what Joe was kind of saying just about the core progression thing kind of reminded me of the genre chat that me and Rainwater had about how those structures kind of echo each other, even though like Jaws and Alien are the same movie, but it, they're, they're not obviously. But when when you're looking at something, Joker, do you question if it's too much like something else? Like if it like I don't want to say question originality, but do you know what I mean? Like there, there's a, a, a moment when I think every artist is like, this is not original. Why, why am I ripping off my favorite things or whatever like that? So I'm curious to know, a, do you do you get that? And B, how do you deal with it? Yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm glad you mentioned Joe's comics too because they're brilliant and everybody. <laughs> should read them. Um, if you guys ever like anybody listening, if you enjoyed like Bumco cartoons, like like uh, George Licker or like Ren and Stimpy, anything like that, but, like kind of like more relevant because I feel like those are a little more relevant than that. Um, enjoy those so i guess just complimenting Thank my you. buddy on that show with um, <laughs> but anyway um i digress i question every single question or every single thing in my life personally <laughs> and artistically. okay uh, that's why i'm on about two different medications right now and i haven't put out <laughs> comics since I graduated college um, so I'm a very good or maybe the worst person to have on this particular. Um, well, maybe we'll because... help you grow out of it out of this one podcast. Who knows? Miracles can well, happen. 
but thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I will say, um, Joe, you did something. It was the 365 days, which like is still running. Like the clock of the meter is <clears throat> not out on that for you, um, which is impressive. Um, I did try it. I did not last that long. Um, I was kind of a one pump chump at that one. So. <laughs> It didn't go well. Um, so, wait, I, I haven't heard that phrase. So I'll take huh? it. <laughs> One pump <time. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, uh, there's a reason I wore blue. But anyway, so I feel like that inspired me to like kind of get with the program, though, um, just because I saw how far you came and how far you got with developing projects. And I'm like, yeah. I should start making decisions. And like I did, but not enough. And so we're working on doing that some more. And with regard to Zhao, your question, just to keep on point um, of originality, I'm kind of with Joe on this one where all of your experiences and tastes kind of make up something greater than the sum of its parts, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're lucky, and I think it has to be an informed decision though, um, because you have, I mean, go to the video racks, you'll see a lot of direct to video, like Grindhouse, like, uh, Transmorphers and, you know, <laughs> the uh, ripoffs sure. or something instead of Godzilla. Yeah. And like, they're fun, but they're not mm -hmm. heartfelt. They're like a quick buck kind of thing. Right. Uh, sure. and so like in order to make a quality narrative that moves someone, which I think is what our goal is, at least on this podcast, uh, everybody, you know, together, um, even if it moves them to laugh, if it moves them to be like, wow, like that dude's getting fucked, you know, like, or whatever, so, you know, it, it'll move them to something instead of just laugh at like corniness, right? Like yeah. that's the hope. Right. So, like all of our, we have to kind of take all of it into us. Like we're a hopper. Right. And I mean, I think there's a, there's a negative stigma on that in in the zeitgeist right now just because people resent people like quentin tarantino who just constantly references things and like kind of nick scorsese's you know big deal shots and everything and then it becomes like a classist kind of like mm, well i'm a more cinemaphile than you or whatever like sure i guess and like i don't know i just feel like quality stories are quality stories and what's an entry point for one person is like a classic movie that came out decades ago. Maybe the entry point for a newer person is your thing. And then your thing guides them back to that thing. So, yeah. So I mean, something ability too. I, I want to give rainwater an opportunity to kind of weigh in on this, but before I do, I just want to kind of echo what you were saying. I was on Twitter the other day and because I was bored and had nothing to do, I decided to get into an argument. <laughs> Um, somebody was <laughs> ranting or something like that about the same old shit about how they hate how all like how they keep doing remakes and how they don't want to see uh, Bruce Wayne's parents get shot in the next Batman movie again or da 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 da. And because I was just kind of feeling contrarian and trollish and again had nothing to do, um, I made an argument and I actually convinced myself, which was fucking shocking, but. I, th maybe it's because I just became a father, but at some point in an, uh, at some point or another, my son is gonna watch a Batman movie, and in that sure. Batman movie, he's not gonna know me. shit about Batman and the death of the Waynes, and he's gonna have yeah. to experience that for the first time. Yeah. So right. there's that, and then there's also the way Tim Burton killed Bruce's parents, the way Zack Snyder killed Bruce's parents, and the yeah. way Christopher Nolan killed Bruce's parents are all different. So it was like, oh, yeah. there's a different angle on how you can do this every single time. So why wouldn't we be interested in seeing... I, you know what I mean? Like, that was the number one complaint when Spider-Man got rebooted was, oh, I better not have to watch Uncle Ben get shot again. I fucking know that already. It's like, yeah, but... I fucking cry every time I watch Tobey Maguire lose Uncle Ben and then, you know, Andrew Garfield loses them and I'm like, oh, man, this fucking sucks. Like, I, I kind of want to see Tom Holland give that performance watching Uncle Ben die because I watched t fucking Tom Holland die and he fucking broke me like six different ways to Sunday. So I'm watch I'm thinking to myself, there's value in kind of recreating things because an artist, like you said, is going to come at it 
from a different angle, usually than yeah. what's already been done before. So, Rainwater, right, can you speak to that? Go, yeah, absolutely. That's where I was just going to with chime it. chime in on what you're saying, Joe. I would say, as somebody who, as a child, attended church regularly, uh, there's only so many different messages that a preacher's going to get across in church, and that message is usually just like, how can I get somebody out in the audience to come to Jesus? And so, week after week after week, it's like the same method, but from a different from a different angle yeah. every single time. And I say this as somebody who, like, looking back on it now, there is an art to that kind of performance. Sure. There's an art to – it's an art of persuasion, right? Uh, and the more passionate the argument that a person makes, the more – oftentimes the more persuasive it can be for people because churches – uh, not all churches, but I guess I say this as somebody who was raised in a more like evangelical, um, Baptist sort of scenario. So it gets a little, it gets passionate. It gets, yeah. it gets very, it's, it's logos and ethos and pathos all together, which, um, I'm going a little bit too into it. But anyway, my point is you have to like figure out different way, different ways to persuade a person. Right. And so I think uh, going on what you were saying, like what this was making me think about is you are, it doesn't really, what's more interesting is the way that you get across the ideas, right? And that's what we all want to see. And that's what we oftentimes uh, imbue with the concept of originality. And so let's get back to the topic, right? Of instinct, right? Uh, when we're talking about, because I think part of what you're saying or what you were started off the topic with, Jao, was this idea of like, well, if it's instinctual, if it seems to come off intuitively without like any sort of um, like connected in the environment sort of idea where you can say, oh, I, I can see where you came up with this idea. We oftentimes will imbue that with some sense of either genius or originality or like, you know, some ineffable quality, mm -hmm. right? And oftentimes, and this is kind of going back to what Joe was saying, what, what Matt was saying earlier, is that it is, the, it is oftentimes the product of the overall cultural environment that a person soaks in. But it is also um, a part of just the instinct. So to digress a little bit, instinct, at least as far as I understand it, is a... It's a compilation of the actions a person lives throughout their lives. So, for an example, let's go to the Karate Kid, right? Uh, Mr. Miyagi teaches Daniel San how to, you know, how to. I can't really remember what the name of the move is, but wax you know, on, like he teaches, off. yeah, he teaches the wax on, wax off maneuver with Daniel San not knowing what the fuck this is about. Why are you teaching me this? I don't understand what the point is. Later on in the movie, right? Set up some payoffs, right? We find out, yep. you know, in the idea, I mean, it seems like in martial arts, the idea is you learn kata so that you can instinctually take in, you know, um, these movements so that when you need to use them, you're not thinking about using them. You're just using them. So yeah. I don't know. You're you, you as somebody who, who has actually like been in martial arts for a pretty long amount of time, you might know better about that than me, right? And I'm curious what you think about that. As someone who analogy. has done martial arts for over 20 years and taught martial arts for abundance yeah. of years, I don't even know how many. Um, it, it, Yes and no. Part of it is to get yeah. you, it, it's muscle memory so that you just react because you don't, you, you really can't yeah. be in your head thinking while you're in the middle of a uh, confrontation. But at the same time, you need shit to fill up your class with, and you can't just keep throwing front kicks every week because <laughs> the parents in the back <laughs> sipping their Dunkin' Donuts are going to be like, "Why are we paying all this money? All they do is the same kick." That's hilarious. Um, you know, and well, it's, me, it, maybe I need to go with a better analogy then. And well, I'll uh, go ahead, Joe. I was going to say too. Um, so, like, I I grew up going to church and doing all that too, and uh, my stepdad's actually a pastor too, but. Uh, one of the things when I was learning music was my first like any like performances were at church, and I think that something helped me a lot with that was that 
all the musicians knew how to play and we knew music, but we would be playing with singers that didn't. So you might rehearse for the week and then show up and they start singing a key, a song in a different key. And you're in front of like a church full of people. So like, yeah. you can't sit there and be like, no, 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 we're supposed to do this in C. You just have to like, I, oh, I guess we're playing an F now. It's kind of jazz then, like, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, kind of like what Matt was saying was like for that kind of stuff, you can't, you need to get to a point to where like you aren't thinking about now this is how i play an f this is how i do a g you need to be able to just access all those so you can use them as it comes up and, so, and nobody's going to kick you in the head playing music so, so <laughs> then then let me ask the 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 room here um and we'll we'll start with joker and we'll go we'll go around but um when it comes to instinct at least for me when I am doing something and I'm trying to, and I have a set goal to accomplish sometimes, when I'm doing it, I will constantly, and this is where I start getting too over analytical when I'm working on things, I will start wondering if I'm being way too over the top or if I'm being way too subtle. Because sometimes I'll put something in there and it'll be very subtle and I'll be like, okay, people will be smart enough to pick up on this. And no one fucking gets it. And then other times, mm -hmm. I will be so over the top. I'm like, Jesus, I'm going to beat them over the head with this or whatever. And no one fucking gets it. And it's one of those things where it's like, I cannot catch a goddamn break. How, like, where is the middle line where they always say, you're, don't underestimate your audience. And I'm just sitting here going, well, then I f fucking suck. Because my audience isn't getting anything that I'm doing. I can't shove it in their face and I can't like dangle it either like it, either or never seems to work for me and i constantly will sit there and go am i hitting this hard this line too hard or is it too subtle and it's just going to sneak by and it's going to be one of those things that pops up on an imdb trivia that like a thousand people will like because now the movie makes sense like so joker i will start with you and then we'll go around the room but uh, when it comes to um trusting your instinct as terms of like subtlety and stuff like that. What are some experiences you've had or thoughts that you have on that particular issue? I have issues with being subtle, um, not personal issues as like I'm against it. I'm certainly not. I'm just not very good at it. Um, as you might have told from my previous times on the show, um, I'm working on it like everything. Um, but I think one's own personal biases can result in repetitive conventions all on their own. I think if you're thinking about style, you're not going to have a good one. Yeah. I think if you yeah. make a movie as yourself in your own skin, a style will surface. Um, they always say, I mean, I've heard the quote and I don't know who to attribute it to. So I'm sorry, internet. Um, <laughs> style is what you wrong. Style is what? Yeah. Style is what you do wrong. Hmm. And... I think with regard to people getting or not getting something that's either subtle or just slapping them over the head with it, I think, and I have to be very careful here, Joe, because we're friends and I'm not trying to give you a backhanded any kind of anything or any kind of whatever. I'm, I'm thicker skinned than <laughs> I once was, but go for it. <laughs> no, I know you don't, but like I do. So just, I guess, take note. Sure. Um, I think people getting it or not, and I have trouble with this too. <laughs> <laughs> See, that was people subtle. Think... I was trying to do that subtle. No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I think people getting something or not getting something has a lot to do with how invested they are in your art. Yeah, um, 100%. And, and I think in, if you want somebody to get something subtle or some kind of a nod or trend or convention later on in your work, even if it's like five to ten pages in, you have to grab them as soon as possible. Like you have to science, almost scientifically craft like an opening or some kind of marketing or some kind of anything to get them personally invested um, in your stuff. And then they're going to be paying attention instead of just like, I'm watching this and I hope it's good, but I'm kind of already decided that it probably won't be. So I'm just gonna kind of have to now. Well, that's why they're not getting your reference, probably. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm not speaking to your work in particular, but like yeah. a person's reference, right? Um, I mean, I've made references in my stuff, too, even for classes. And like, I thought it was going to just like 
you know, bottle flip, like, oh, like everybody. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Nothing. So, like, I just think it's hard to get people invested, especially this is the hardest time in our history, I would argue, to get people invested in a narrative because there are narratives everywhere. There are narratives yeah. on some candy bar wrappers, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. And like, we've had so much media and like to go to your point of like repetitive or am I echoing something like, you know, collective subconsciously? Yeah, I mean, maybe, but there's just so much media now, you could do anything, even something you haven't heard of. And it's probably exactly like something somebody else did. And if you get famous enough, you'll find out on message boards that you did rip them off and you had no idea they even existed. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I, that actually happened That's to me with true. Haunted with the, with the script. I had written a line and I, I, it was from Scream 2, which I, it's my favorite Scream movie. And I hadn't even realized that I had done it. And then I, I was talking with one of the cast members or whatever. And I, obviously I was gushing over the Scream movies or whatever. And she told me, oh, I'm going to go watch Scream 2 this weekend. I was like, oh, I love you. Have fun. And she went and she watched it. And then she goes, my line is in that movie. They stole my line. And then I realized, oh shit, no, I stole the line. And that was like a, a, a an oh fuck moment for me where it was like, oh shit, now I'm quoting movies in my scripts. Fuck me. Like it just was one of those one of those bad days where I was like, I need to be a better writer. But um but yeah, so I, I think that's a valid point that especially when you don't have an established style necessarily, because I've only made one film. And so if I don't have something running through seven films, it's hard for people to pick up on it. But in terms of like a subtle thing, like I have to, when I'm writing a screenplay, I have to be very choosy with what I write in my action lines because I'm trying to persuade, um, kind of like Rainwater was talking about, like an actor to perform a line a certain way. And if at a table reading, they're not paying attention to how that action line is written or like why I chose specific words. They might perform the line wrong. And then the entire room reads it the same way. And it's like, Oh, well, no one's going to get that now because that one actor didn't pay attention. So yeah, I guess that's, that's a valid point. Um, Mr. Bevel. Yes. What are your thoughts on trusting instinct in this situation? Um, I think Matt was really, right about like someone has to be invested to really dig into the subtle stuff like like i'm the kind of person that used to be one of the assholes that would like freeze frame like simpsons episodes to see the like jokes in the background like i eat stuff like that up like i love little like little background silly shit just throwing about things but i also know most people don't do that like the majority sure. like, general audiences whatever you want to call it like they're not doing that and so I know for me, like, in my own work, I just put it in and I hope somebody gets it. Um, and I also test stuff out on people, too. There was a joke that I had in my comic, Cotton, that didn't make it. And it was about um, a Blue Oyster Cult song. And um, are you guys familiar with that band? Yeah. yeah. So it's like, but it's, <laughs> yeah, that's like um, subtle enough. Yeah. Most people. Sure. But now but was it like, was it know, like a, was it like a, a a banger or was it a deep cut? Like what was cuz if you're if you're <laughs> referencing so, Don't Fear the Reaper then like I'm absolutely going to get it. But if you're like referencing a deep cut, I'm going to be like went right over my head. Uh Godzilla? Mhm. Mm yeah. It was a guy at a urinal and he was singing the song uh <laughs> Look Out Tokyo here but you don't see the rest of the and it's like nobody's going to get that. I thought it was hilarious. I, I would have fucked all, yeah, right. But, but I cut it because you know it's a dumb dick joke. <laughs> um, That's the special edition right there, man. I want the DVD features on there. Oh my god, yeah, it's it's some on a piece of paper somewhere. Well, you know, it's interesting too because um, your instinctive judgments can either play to your favor or against your favor. I have a story. Uh, this goes a little bit outside of art to a certain extent, and still involves it but so uh before i went to scad i went to a college called lsu uh, louisiana state university and i took um i took an international politics course with a friend and it turned out to be a pretty fun course we uh like one of the books we had to read was ender's game so i was like oh okay i get to read science fiction i'm down um 
turned out to be a great uh, way of like thinking about international politics, but that's neither here nor there. Um, in that class, we were supposed to write papers fairly regularly, just our thoughts on like, okay, here's, here's an international political conundrum. What do you think about this? Well, <clears throat> during my time at LSU, I was really bored. I just did not have anything to do. So I wrote multiple papers for one topic one day, just because. And as it turned out, one of my friends in that class did not write a, had not written a paper in time. And I was like, you know, I have some extra papers if you just need one. <laughs> wow. He was like, what? <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> changed a couple of words here and there, made, it, made sure it didn't look like my writing. And I gave him what I thought was going to be, you know, the the worst of the two papers. And it was basically the topic was like, here's an international situation between, I think it was China and, and the situation with Taiwan. And one paper was like for and the other paper was against. And uh, so I gave him the one that was like, I think it was against. It was my least favorite of the two. I thought it wasn't going to do that well. So the next day, you know, we turn in the papers, and a week later, we get our grades back. I get a B. He gets an A. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. what the fuck? But that's the thing. Is like sometimes what you think in your head is the better, the better position of two things is not always necessarily correct. And... I think this goes back to sort of Matt's original position to, and to modify a little bit and say that you, because with art, you cannot, you cannot know entirely what's in the other person's mind, right? You're trying to communicate the things that you think are commonalities between you and the other person, but at a certain level, you're still guessing. You're still guessing at what is the, what are the things that are going to really hit home Sometimes you hit you hit the nail on the head and you and, and you get, you know, the joke that hits home for everybody. And then other times, you know, you get things that it's like it's either too subtle, goes over their head too much, or they just don't like your position is the other part. You know what I mean? Like sometimes people just don't like your ideas and so you get a bad um you get a bad uh, response to it. So I would be curious, though, if for either, I mean, for everybody here, um, I would be curious to hear some examples of times that any of y'all had sort of spur of the moment, had a creative moment where it really worked out in your favor and you didn't necessarily expect it to work out in your favor. And maybe start, uh, Matt, would you mind starting this? Sure. And, and, uh, just while you were talking, it reminded me of our late professor, Tom Lyle, uh, oh, yeah. uh, illustrator of such things as uh, Spider-Man Saga, Starman, uh, the Robin series at DC. Um, I took virtually three quarters of my sequential classes with him, and he told this story in every class that if you are ever presented by an editor to, like, I want you to design a cover and then you give them options of like three or four different rough covers, he would always tell us, never give them any covers you are not fully behind and willing to have put out there. Because he's like, I guarantee you, 99% of the time, they're going to pick the shittiest cover. Yep. <laughs> That's gonna... such a good story. I had forgotten about that story. Yeah, me That's too. Yeah, I'm like... And I mean, I'm trying to keep him alive just through the, the okay. glove of a stories he told and like oh, yeah. industry insider knowledge like um so that was just a fun little anecdote but anyway it was working out that i didn't expect them to work out um i've had a lot of illustration gigs since college that are just like people being like hey can you draw this for me can you draw this thing for me you know can you and then you know work up track bloody blue you know do the thing and like there have been things, I'm not going to name which ones, because if they're watching this, I want sure. them to be as happy with as possible. <laughs> there have been things where I'm like, this doesn't work. Like, I'm a fraud. Like, this is ridiculous. And then they're just like, this is really great. You just made my entire day. Everything's perfect with it. And I'm just like, oh, snap, you know? Like, um, And then even going back further in school, there was one comic that I drew. It was like a one-page comic 
and it was like an intro to sequential assignment and it was like drawing like a moment in your life or something just like a narratively interesting moment yeah when i took my straight laced buddy to the goth club for the first time and my ex-girlfriend was there in a net shirt and she came up and just completely rubbed her um dirty pillows in my face and my friend just felt really awkward about the whole thing <laughs> I thought that was pretty narratively interesting both in yeah. scene and event and um but then i was like mm, is this too much this is ridiculous like there's there's no way this is going to go over like it landed hard people <laughs> loved it. like i was amazed like i just kind of was like drawing time out of a hat or whatever but um yeah, that really worked out. And I mean, maybe that's not what was intended by the question, but... No, yeah. that is exactly for sure. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. Because I feel like what we consider sort of instinctive or intuitive is what comes to your mind first. You know what I mean? Like, not necessarily in the sense of like a Rorschach test, but in the sense of like... Because I think for a lot of artists, they will go by what is their immediate impulse to create. Like sometimes yeah. there are ideas that sort of ruminate, you know, and you think about and become a big thing. And then there are sometimes there are those ideas where it's like kind of spark of the moment and you're like, I got to do this thing right now. It's sometimes it's the stupidest thing ever, but you're just like, I got to make this. I got to make example. <laughs> I didn't necessarily make this, but it led to something to a great moment for me, which was that um, I posted on Twitter just sort of wondering about the cultural moment that would be the um, the the tangent between uh, Inya and trap music, and <laughs> lo and behold, to my sur surprise, Joe Bevel submits a thirty-second sound clip that I was stunned by. <laughs> it was everything I could have wanted and more, and so. Um, I, I guess I cite that as an example of like sometimes first impulses sort of will lead to these wonderful moments. And so, Joe, I don't. Do you have an example for yourself personally of like something, either as just like an impulsive sort of thing that you wanted to create that that had a great impact? Uh, yeah, I guess I go with that as a question. <laughs> um, so one thing I forgot about that. I was <laughs> that was literally um, I was on Twitter instead of working. <laughs> as one so, does yeah and so that's how that happened um i don't think i have anything specific but i will say something i've started doing is when i make an illustration now um before i like say this is done or like whatever i start messing with it in photoshop or doing whatever like deleting the line work or um changing like the hue or just playing with it and most of the time stuff from those experiments ends up being like whatever show um and i feel like those are the kind of things that i might not choose for myself because like you know to be honest like i don't draw enough <laughs> to like have good instinct i feel like now to I where like it. you know like, i don't have the level of comfort i do like say on guitar or something sure but um but i do think that like i make the right choice when i get to the end of it yeah yeah so no i mean looking at your design work i get the sense that you know, when you're, you have a definite sense of the right choices to make. You know what yes. I mean? Yes. Uh, yeah. Had recently shared a project with me that I that I, I when I was looking through it, I was like, oh yeah, like you were making design decisions that for myself, like I did, I had never even really considered for like laying out stuff. And oh yeah. Like yeah. And so I'm curious. I guess this is just like a secondary question. For you, are those decisions thought out or are at this point, have they become sort of part of your overall framework to such an extent that like you don't you're not thinking that super deep about it? So part of me part of me being like kinda quick with that is for my design stuff, I kinda have made the decision to like start grid based all the time. Just okay. because of my comics yeah, background. Sense. And so like you might not even, I mean, the project I sent you, you can see the grid, but usually, like, you can play with it to a point where you don't even notice it, but that's how I'm able to, like, 
assembled quickly because I'm really just thinking of it as like block, 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 space, you know. And then, so breaking it down to those simple things, I'm not worried about like the details yet. And I can go fast. That makes a lot yeah. of sense to me because, like, with, yeah. with laying out pages for uh, comics, like, I'm now at this point where I'm like, I have a device. I mean, I this is pretty basic, but I used to go against the grain of this, where it's just like dividing the page into three parts. Oh yeah, and then just like it simplifies laying it out so much because there's there's that many less decisions that you have to make. And yeah. so this might this kind of goes back to an older topic of like the more you limit the the more you limit your range of decisions that you can make, the easier it is to make because yes. you're not having to like constantly parse out like, oh, do I need a you know, like you're just you're having fewer decisions to make. So anyway, Jal, yeah. for yourself, do you have any uh, examples of like first impulse creative decisions that really worked out in your favor? Well, yes, I have at least two that I'm going to bring up. And I wanted to, to first commend you because you picked up on something. You didn't specifically cite it, but it was exactly where I was going to go to next with the podcast, which was uh, the instinctual part of an artist to want to take risks, which is basically what we've been yeah. talking about. Um, and that's where an artist is separated for me from an entertainer. An entertainer will default to what they know will get a laugh, whereas an artist will try something that they feel will get the laugh, but they are, but it hasn't been done. Does you know you know what I mean? Like it, it's it's out there, or yeah. it's not common, it's not obvious, it's one of those things. And for me, we're going all the way back now to digits, which I just realized the other day we're coming up on the ten year anniversary of Jesus Christ. Damn. Um, uh, there were two instances in that movie, and there's a lot of off-color humor in that movie don't get me wrong but me and a couple of the people that were involved on it had a lot of fights over the very first line of the movie and i know a lot of people that are listening to this podcast have not seen the movie so i will just spoil it for you right now the opening line was who wants to play heath ledger and then they jump they drop a bunch of uh pills out on a, a table and turn it into a drinking game now this was 2011. The line was written in 2008, shortly after Heath Ledger had passed. I want to be on the record as saying I love Heath Ledger. Phenomenal artist, wonderful human being, tragic end. You never want to see someone go like that. All of those things. However, the line was in contention with a lot of people because they were like, this is too soon. And I literally pointed to them and said, this character's nickname is TS, which represents too soon. His gimmick is he makes jokes that are, are too soon because he himself is uncomfortable with death. He lost his father as a child, and he tries to make jokes to cope with that loss. That is the point. I knew it instinctually. Yeah. I knew we had to open the movie with that, and I knew that we had to do it that way. And it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. And there were late night arguments about, you need to cut that line. We need to write a different way. Can we make up a celebrity? Can we do something else? And I stuck to my guns. And I knew in my heart of hearts, if that joke landed, the whole movie worked. It's all that had to happen. And what had happened was, Rainwater, you were there that night when we had the, the premiere. Oh, I yeah. was on the, the edge of my seat. And I was like, if this joke lands... We're good. And the second it dropped, at least three quarters of the theater was laughing. And yeah. it, it took a and moment for it to kind of, to like it was a slow yeah. build laugh. And then everybody was like, they realized what the fuck was going on. And that's when I sat back and I was able to enjoy the rest of the, the night. And it was one of those moments that was so rewarding to me because I was right and the masses were wrong. Like everyone telling me, Andrew, don't do it. It's, it's, it's too pushy. It's too touchy. People are going to get upset. I could not do that joke this day. now th these days. People would kill me if I mocked somebody's death because it's kind of a common thing for the internet trolls to do and this and that. But at that time, you just didn't see it in movies. It wasn't that kind of sure. cool humor that happened. And I trusted my instinct, and it paid off. And then again in that movie, there was another time, um, same character, says things that are off color just to, to get a rise out of people because he's, uh, he's kind of a troll like character. 
and they were talking about, I believe it was Helen Keller, and it's one of my favorite jokes in the whole movie where they're talking about their friend being led around by his arm by his new girlfriend, and he says, look, at he's it's like she's Helen Keller and he's the... Or, He's Helen Keller, and she's the blind-seeing eye dog. Another character responds, I don't think Helen Keller had a blind-seeing a, a, a blind eye dog. And he just deadpan, doesn't even change his, his face. He goes, well, maybe if she did, she would have been so fucking retarded. And that line, because it was so cringy and offensive and everything like that, got yeah. a lot of pushback from everybody. But instinctually sure. for me, I was like, this character is an asshole he needs to say things that are asshole like to establish his assholeness that's the point yeah. and a lot of people were uncomfortable with it and i understood that like it's not a risk that i think a lot of people not mainstream movies you know what i mean like not even a lot of like very ballsy artists would take i'm not you know giving building myself up as a ballsy artist but in that mm -hmm. moment i knew that character had to do it and when it did it the, the audience laughed because they weren't laughing with him because he's not laughing. He's not making a joke. He's being an asshole. They're laughing yeah. at him for being so fucking terrible. Like, it's almost like a pity right. laugh, I guess you could call it. But afterwards, the actor came up to me and he was like, I apologize so hard for both of those things because you were right and I was wrong. And for me, it was so instinctual or it was so rewarding to have – my instincts to defend those horrific jokes that made me feel validated as an artist, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and absolutely. That's uh, so to kind of to to finite the point. Now, I'm curious to know from you guys uh, when it comes to bold swings, what are your what are your opinions on trusting your instinct with stuff like that? Because sometimes it can. It can go the other way. I'm not saying for me, I've batted yeah. 300. I like yeah. every time when I'm doing it, I have gotten off by the grace of God that no one has canceled me yet. But I don't think I'm big enough to cancel, so that's why. I'm sure digits will rear its ugly head one day when I've made a Marvel movie or <laughs> yeah. some shit, and that's the end of me. But I'm curious to know for you guys is when you're trying to take a risk with your art, how do you look at it from the perspective of is this too risky or is this too offensive? Is this too out there? Is this too controversial? Like wh where do you, your instincts land when it comes to that? Do you put your art first or do you put, I almost want to say your career or your reputation first, which one do you, and I don't think it's cowardice. To, uh, let me preface by saying, I don't think it's cowardice to put your career first. We all got to put food on the table and keep the roofs over our head. Right. But yeah. I'm curious to know your sure. opinions on that particular matter. When it comes to taking risks, how much should you trust your instinct and how much should you trust other people? Um, so I will say like, I feel like now versus like, so I used to have a webcomic that was like pretty offensive and like harsh. <laughs> and, uh, but it was a different time. Right. And when I was, when I was starting out, like even in college too, like my goal was always first to like just be as raw and yeah. annoying as possible. Yep. So I like seeing a reaction and someone like a disgust reaction yes. from people. <laughs> Amen. Right to that. <laughs> you know, and I was always like just trying to find like the worst thing. And even now, like when I'm writing, my brain probably goes to something terrible. And then I'm like, well, throw that one away. And <laughs> Let then me the dial next back. Thing. <laughs> yeah. But I kind of chilled out with that when uh, I did one joke and get back. And um, it was just like a really easy, shitty Chinese restaurant joke. And um, one of my friends like DM me about it, and he was just like, "Why?" And it was the first time where I was like, "Yeah, that was kind of fucked up," and I didn't even really have a reason for it. It was low hanging fruit. Sure. Sure. And then I was like, "If I'm gonna do something even a little edgy, I want to at least have a reason for it, or some kind of like contextual reason, because otherwise, I'm just like." The comedian that comes to mind first would be like Tosh 2.0, whatever his name is. Yeah, to Tosh. where like yeah. he might say things that are funny, but it, there's never like meat to it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, so it might be a good joke, but it's like, oh, well, you just shadow on like somebody in a wheelchair for no fucking reason. Sure, it's like the equivalent <laughs> to horror of like the jump scare, where it's like yes. it's just there, yeah. simply for a reaction and doesn't serve any other purpose beyond that. Yeah, basically. 
Yeah, so. So, yeah, my instinct now, and also, I've gotten older, as, <laughs> as we all. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to fight with people on Twitter about something I did, so. Yeah. <laughs> Doing the dishes and paying the bills takes a lot of energy out of you, and it's just like, I don't got time for this fucker. Like, I go ahead. <laughs> like, I'm not going to yeah. engage. Sure. Yeah. No time. Well, Matt, what about for you uh, in terms of the topic about uh, wh- how did you how did you phrase it, Jow? Like brashness? Yeah, just about, like to... taking taking a risk that, you know, you know, someone's going to disagree with, but your instinct might tell you that's the way to go. Like it's it's an internal struggle. Like, how would you approach that? Yeah, so. As I kind of referenced earlier, I'm somebody who will second guess themselves either before or after or both to every decision that I make, um, sometimes way too much. For instance, I'm, I've am i been listening and enjoying the conversation, but I've also been processing how internally cringy I feel that I used the word dirty pillows earlier in the episode. This is terrible. I feel like I betrayed each and every female friend I have as well as my wife. Um, breasts are nothing to be ashamed of and they're part of the female identity and as I'm not joking I'm not joking um, I don't know I just wanted to say that but at any rate sure. I just felt like it fit in um, riskiness is a hard thing because right. the main thing that I am dealing with in my own work right now is that I like a lot of the hero or protagonist characters who are I guess less than squeaky clean like an anti-hero but not an anti-hero in the edgelord like I'm Deadpool McPunisher the (laughs) the whatever you know fuck toy I fucking needs to say on the internet fuck them but like (laughs) oh what it is is like I like a lot of like 70s grindhouse movies simply because of the power of their statements there's good shit there there's good shit stylistically there there's good you know but they are sometimes some of the cringier movies just because they just for shock value every Mm -hmm. single time so what i'm trying to do is hone that down into a more modern sensibility where i keep a lot of the style and power but then i kind of dial back some of the cringe and i'm just like i don't know if that's possible Mm. and like i'm struggling with that as well as how do you make a hero that people that people will tear up over at times who murders a lot of people and that's harder than you might think Mm. i mean like there has to be a hell of a lot of cats to save sure you know what i'm saying yeah (laughs) like reference acknowledged um, yeah, same. <laughs> reference sorry. reference was acknowledged. I just as the guy who went on a ten minute rant about whether or not someone should be subtle, I wanted to say reference was acknowledged. <laughs> yeah, no. but see, you were invested in in what I was saying, and that that yeah. kind of goes to my point. It's like you know you have to be invested to catch something, and I feel like one of the better ways that the 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 murder hero has been done, so to speak. Is like in the Sin City movie, not so much. I mean, not maybe not even the comic book as much as the movie, just because I feel like they ground down a couple of the sharp edges on Marv. Um, but like Mickey Rourke did a hell of a job making you feel for him, and like you know, Rosie made him feel like a person when no one else would, and you know, he lost her literally the first night he met her, um, just to all time, you know, and and then you're like, yeah fucking kill all those guys fuck those guys like you know even like the most moral person gets a little bit jazzed when he like you know kills some dude even like when he shoots like a corrupt preacher it's a corrupt preacher you know played by frank miller but all the same you know like um but that's that's a riskiness that i feel like i have trouble with in my own writing that gives me pause and perhaps too much pause um, just because there's always the quandary in action films where it's like, how do you mitigate real life laws and police? How do you mitigate that much murder? How do you mitigate that that person is still a hero and hasn't gone to jail? Yeah. Um, you know, because in the real world, I mean, there's cops 
who are murdering people and not going to jail, and they're not heroes. You know, there's people who aren't murdering people who go to jail, and they are heroes. And so it's like, how do you tell that story, you know? Um, Yeah, I don't know. And I mean, as far as, I guess the last thing I'll say in my little bit here is, if you go hard, you have to be prepared to lose them hard immediately. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean that's and then that I think that's, I think that's something particularly in the age of social media that people are are learning is that uh, when you, when you go hard and you don't hit hard, that the fall is is pretty hard. Yeah, right? the bold yeah. swings definitely will make you whiff occasionally. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's and yeah. and that's that's kind of my fear is like a, a lot of. I think it was Donald Glover who was uh, complaining about this on Twitter the other day about how artists aren't taking chances anymore. And God save that man, because I don't know if any of you guys have watched Atlanta. That fucking show is brilliant in a can. Like, it's just like it starts off relatively. I don't want to call it generic, but it's very it's in its setup. It's very normal just kind of a, you know, oh, here's a guy in this scenario and he's got to deal with it, whatever. And by like episode six, there's invisible cars. And it's like fucking <laughs> just like that's the kind of shit that I love. And I like those bold swings even when they haven't paid off immediately. Because like we said, you can lose them like immediately. But you can also, and here's where something that I think that a lot of artists needs to hear is that sometimes your instincts will have been correct. And as to what I believe it was either Joe or Rainwater, we're talking about a different period of time. Um, You might be ahead of the time. Uh, And that's an attribute that a lot of artists have. And I think we question whether or not we have it or not, but we are, are, are ahead of the time. So this past weekend, I saw a movie called Mandy with Nicolas Cage. Shout out if you've seen this movie. Because it came out in 2018, so about three years ago. And I remember hearing about it, people talking about it a lot and this and that. But, it, you know, to me, it was more, it was par for the course with Nicolas Cage movies, Nicolas Cage doing Nicolas Cage things. And I saw it this past weekend, and I shit you not, that movie had so many bold swings in every aspect of filmmaking storytelling, acting, fucking color correction, the whole nine yards. And it, literally struck a creative chord with me where I have been in my office more this weekend than I have in the last 10 years working on things, writing, doing visual effects work, creating things like it literally awoke something in me because of the bold swings that they were taking in that movie. And when it came out in 2018, I heard about it, but I didn't bother to watch it. And you know what I mean? It was one of those things where the payoff came for me later where I found it later. And I think that's one of the things that artists need to do from an instinctual standpoint is that if you know you're right, don't apologize, take the big swing. And if you know you're going down, go down with, with the art. But then to, to Joe Bevel's point, if you know, you fucked up, like, like there are things that I've, (laughs) I, there are things that I have written in the past. God knows if anybody ever finds my live journal, I'm done. Um, yeah, I gotta get mine too. That uh, I tried to close. I found it one day, and I tried to get rid of it. And apparently, it's owned by Russians now. And they wanted me to take a picture of my license and send it to prove that it was me, because God knows what password I used in that back in that day. And they were like, "Yeah, we will not close down an account." I'm like, "All right, well, fuck it," because I said horrible, horrible, ignorant, close-minded things about gay people, about kids that I knew in school and stuff like this, fucking things that make me cringe in this moment. So when Joe said something about, you know, there was a joke that he made or when Joker talked about 10 minutes ago when he made a joke and he's second guessing it now, I think you can look back at something and say, you know what, maybe that wasn't right. And I think that's another instinctual thing that artists need to do as well is own your fuck ups. Jane, James Gunn had to do yeah. that. He was kind of a, uh, he called himself like a, a, I think he called himself a provocateur or like a shock artist back in the day when they tried to cancel him out of doing Disney movies and this and that. And he owned it. Like he said, yeah, what I said was wrong. And it kills me to this day that I said it. I wish I hadn't said it, 
but there's nothing I can do about it now. I can, other than apologize for it, not do it again, and right. represent the views that I have now in my art now. So right. like that, that's the, the instinct that I think a lot of people need to do is there's, there, there is a fear that comes with being an artist because we are, as, as I've repetitiously stated throughout this entire podcast series, we're all trying to work our shit out through art. And that is a personal thing that we're all trying to do. And as you do it, you are going to fuck up. Like that's yeah. a given. Some, sometimes yeah. that shit makes it to the screen or the stage in you know in full public view, and that is definitely one of the like you're saying. It's one of the risks that comes to being an artist. And I mean, I guess for myself personally, I try to I try to promote that risk taking. I guess I'll say behavior to a, to an extent. You know what I mean? Like I think that I think that uh, artists should be encouraged to take risks. I think artists should be encouraged to make mistakes. Everybody should be encouraged to make mistakes. I honestly feel like, yeah. and there's not enough encouragement. From my perspective, it doesn't seem like there's enough encouragement for people to fuck up in current society. And I think when you have the ability to fuck up and then learn from that mistake and build yourself better and stronger and whatever, you not only feel more encouraged, but you also just don't, you don't feel the weight, the extreme weight of responsibility that could come from messing up. And there are things that I think, you know, it makes sense to take responsibility for. And then on another hand, it's like, if you're an artist, you're also trying to, on some level, have fun. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mm -hmm. is this <laughs> uh, um, on some level, artists are trying to have fun, and I think for the average person, it may not, it may not necessarily. I don't even know if average person is the right way to say somebody who doesn't consider themselves an artist. It may not strike in the same way. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, but I mean, going back to something I've talked about before, it's like doing um, pretend play, make believe. If you're if you're doing make believe, you're 100 percent in there, and it doesn't matter to you whether or not what you're doing or saying is like morally whatever suspect, because you know you're make you know you're in the middle of make believe. You know you're do what you're doing is pretend. You know that what you're doing is not the real world, and so there is so much value that comes from being able to separate yourself from the real world for a little bit so that you can I watched the mask last night. <laughs> I guess that's where this is going. Which one are we uh, talking about? The the Jim Carrey the or the Jamie one. Kennedy version? No, the first one with Jim Carrey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh it's an interesting movie to look at from, you know, 20 years ago because it does go it does kind of go into this theme of like there's the there's the part of you that you're constantly trying to hide away you know, that comes out in random spurts. And then there's the part of you that's like the you that you want to show society, right? And artists tend to want to play way more with the part that typically would get hidden away. And a lot of other people who would not consider themselves artists, and I'm phrasing it like that because I feel like anybody can be an artist. Is just, if they want to uh, be, you know, sure. If they yeah. want to be. It doesn't take much. You just have to be willing to fuck around, is my opinion. But anyway, I'll wrap this up. Um, no, I like my where point you're going is, with uh, my, like point, <laughs> my point is, is artists are people who tend to want to go play in those darker areas or those more mysterious areas or those areas that like we don't commonly hang out in in everyday life because we get bored with everyday life. Yes. And so... That's why I encourage risk taking, and that's why I encourage um, just a sense of going, following your instincts a little bit to see where it'll go. You don't, you don't have to commit. You don't have to go 100% in. You don't have to dive head in, but just take the chance for a little bit. Dip your toe in the water and see what, see what comes about it. Anyway, that's my rant. Um, no, I, I agree, and I mean, beautiful. Largely. 
mean, it's like look at um, like Jow. You're a you're a fan of Universal Monsters, as am I. As are you know probably all of us on the call. Maybe yeah. um, look at the Wolfman, werewolves in general. That's why that myth exists. Uh, you know the wild side of man. You know, and it it's in all of us. I mean, like in certain circles, people might believe that we were fish who walked out of the sea and then became, you know, hairy beasts who then eventually became us. Um, you know, and then that discourse, it, it's in us, you know, like um, it. And, and on some level, it's a psyche, psychological survival trait, right? Um, to, to big yourself up to protect your, your pack or to, you know, uh, assert dominance, I suppose, right? Um, in a tribe, you know, something like that. Um, and then, you know, so many of those instincts have been put in weird drawers today because we're all yes. safe. We're not in, you know, nomadic tribes. Um, you know, we can order Uber Eats or, you know, whatever we, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, so, I mean, it's like people have anxiety because they're being chased by an incredibly slow tiger called worry. Um, yeah. You know, and then I'm relating it back to taking the risks artistically because the risks artistically are wanting to scream at the moon, you know, and just let it out. Like, and I feel like we are abandoning admitting that part of ourselves to common decency. And I feel like the two don't have to be mutually exclusive. No, they don't. Right. And now we have dead air. But that was a beautiful. Uh, that was no. Yeah. But I, I think that you you, that was pretty beautiful. Like I don't think there's anything that anyone needs to tack onto that. That was so well done. Um, so in in wrapping up because we're over the hour now, but we'll we'll keep going a little bit. Um, I'm curious to know in summation, when it comes to an artist taking a risk versus a person taking a risk. Um, do you guys feel like there's a difference? Because like Rainwater, you were differentiating between arts artists and people who do not consider themselves artists. So like if someone who does not consider themselves an artist goes towards goes gambling and they have an instinct that the you know, the dealer's gonna flip over a, a five and they're gonna become a millionaire or whatever, versus an artist who's I don't know, trying to figure out how he's going to make his werewolf alien movie work. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, is there a difference between those kind of risks? Because I think instinctually, we're talking about instinct. The The whole point of instinct is trusting yourself as opposed to trusting something or someone else. So when it comes to art, when you guys are doing your art and you do like this is, I guess, uh, kind of most mostly focused towards Joker. But I know that we all feel it because I know that I have to and Joker pinpointed it perfectly earlier. But when you are questioning yourself and you have two paths to go down, like like your instinct is pulling you in two different directions, I guess is the best way to phrase it. How do you guys deal with that? Or how would you recommend to an artist to deal with that? Because instinct can be a fickle bitch. Because as Joker pointed out, in one moment, he his instinct told him, hey, make this joke. And then 10 minutes later, his instinct said, no, that joke was wrong. Like, how do you, how do you management instinct management? That's what I'm trying to get on. That's <laughs> fucking, I knew That's if I talked question. long enough, I would land on what I was trying to say, which is my fucking strength. Um, how do you go about managing your instincts? Because sometimes it can lead you awry. So in, in the moment, how would you go about differentiating a good move versus a bad one? Anybody. Is this, this to me for okay. anybody? Um, so we kind of brought up like the artist versus like non artist. My mind kind of actually went to artist versus like designer or marketing person since that's what I okay. do day job. Sure. And uh, so something that like tech companies and most modern companies do now is A B testing. Are you, guys, are you guys familiar with that? I haven't heard of that. It sounds so basically, familiar, like, but I don't know what it is. 
you've experienced it even if you don't know you have. So when you go to like a website, a lot of times like like rainwater and drought, like you guys might get two different like headlines at the top. But what they're doing is A B testing. And so for like two weeks they wait till they get five thousand people and then one person gets I like cheese puffs and the other one's getting I like hot Cheetos and they'll see which one people are gravitating more towards yeah. and then that's how they choose their next moves. And so like nothing is done by just guessing what might be right. They mm-hmm. quickly just do like a quick sample. They to put it to a test. Step. Yeah. And so like that's kind of something I've been trying to like apply to my stuff now. Um, so and I don't mean like anything like digital or like counting stuff, but just like a little quick whatever. Yeah. But like uh, I did these four panel gags at the end of last year. And that was actually like a little litmus test to see how that look would go and like th- that style. And then I might do like a little longer next time to see. But, um, but yeah, testing is one way to apply. That's an awesome... I, I've never really thought of, thought in that direction, but that makes a lot of sense. I feel like... So I, I guess too, like I've been working as a designer for like a decade now and it's kind of yeah. changed how I approach things because I'm not thinking of like my creativity and like whatever yeah. it's more about like this is a problem how do i solve it yeah that didn't work how do i solve it you know and so i'm operating more like that and i think a lot of artists could benefit from kind of adapting some hell yeah stuff like <laughs> you, that. you describe that and i'm starting to think of like yeah. i want to try and think in more engineering terms sometimes just as a yeah. main as a way to sort of rein in a lot of the creative impulses because yeah you know, They'll a lot of times you when you go impulsively, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, actually, to show y'all my impulses, Uh-oh. if I didn't like kind of get more structure, <laughs> you would just have like stuff like this for me. <laughs> it's just nonsense. Like, just said, now it's man. Well, yeah. <laughs> say I'm on work calls and I'm just like, I can't listen to things for too long because you know. <laughs> if I if for, my current desk wasn't blocking my old desk because it's a weird setup that I have in my office now. I would hold up all of my note cards where I've broken down mm-hmm. my stories into note cards for beat by beat yeah. by beat. But I have like 12 different versions of the same beat and I will flip flop and take them out and rearrange. It's it's crazy how how much I will. It's almost like, uh, you know, the guys on the sidewalk shuffling cards, follow the red card, follow the black <laughs> card. And that's literally me trying to organize yeah. the story point sometimes. Um, the problem is, is as Joker pointed out earlier, is getting people invested enough to be able to test it out on them. That's the thing. And because right. I don't trust, see, the problem is with me, and this is, a, this is a big instinct question that we probably should have brought up earlier, but I'm going to bring it up now. I don't trust the people around me to give me <laughs> blunt, honest feedback because they don't want to hurt. I, I trust them to not want to hurt my feelings. It's like, oh, that's a really good idea. I like that. That's the worst yeah. fucking thing that they always tell me. And it's like, well, I'm not going to let you read the script anymore. Why not? It's like, tell me what sucks about this. I need to know. Like, I think it's great right now. I can't see the flaws. That's that's part of the problem of being an artist is sometimes you will put it down and you're your artness will blind you from your own flaws. And then oh, you can yeah. put it in a shelf and come back to it two weeks later and be like, what the fuck was I thinking? And it's the responsibility of people around you. This is why this goes back to our discussion about critique. Um, it's a responsibility of people to be honest with their instinctual reactions. I think that's something we need mm-hmm. to talk about is when you are talking to another artist, you do need to be honest with them, but you also don't need to be a dick about it. Like there's a, there's yeah. a way of executing. I think we were talking earlier about it's all in the execution. It's the same thing with a reaction or a critique or something like that is that you're cuz like I've read scripts where I just read it and I just want to look at the person and go this is shit. Why are you wasting my time with this? And it's I mean it's honest to god like I've I literally sat in my screenwriting group and there was a guy who who came from the world of engineering and he wrote a screenplay uh, about uh, he, uh, you know, a character was abducted by the government to build a nuclear bomb or whatever. And it was 120 pages. And for three hours, we sat there and read, read this thing. And me, I, I wanted to blow my brains out. It was just so horrible. But then 
I had to dial myself back and actually fight my own instincts to be a dick because it's almost like as Joker was talking about earlier about the tribes thing, there is kind of a tribalism that will go on sometimes in an artist's head where it's like, you don't belong with artists. Go back to your engineering group and build me a fucking car. Like, and that's something that I think, and this is my biggest problem with the internet. Oh, I'm going to go on a rant right now. I don't know. I don't know when we got to the fucking point where people thought, and this is, and I, oh, I'm getting let loose right now. I don't know why people think they have the fucking right to talk to me about what makes a good movie, what makes good cinematography, what makes good character, blah, 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 when they are not someone who, as Rainwater coined before, considers themselves an artist they are literally the audience and i don't know why the internet is as i like to say polluted with film reviewers why do these people think that instinctually they can watch a movie and they know what the fuck to talk about in terms of dissecting it so this topic needs to be its own podcast (laughs) yeah frankly Because this is this is this goes much larger because it's an instinct thing. On the the only reason I bring it up is it's an instinct thing on the side of the audience where they automatically think they know all. It's like you've never held a camera. Like your camera phone doesn't fucking count. Yes, you can make a movie on your camera or a movie on your cell phone. I'm not knocking that. What I'm saying is is you have never gone into a room and said, "Hey." This would be a cool way to get this shot by starting low on the floor and then maybe we'll hook the camera on the end of a fishing line and we'll pull it up and reel it in at the same yeah. time and we'll get a shot. No, no, no. You sit it there on your fucking – the camera case's tripod, get a shot, reverse shot, edit it on your phone and think that you've made art. And it's like, no, you didn't. You've copied what you've seen before and you've compared it to that and you think – Now you're doing what you're supposed to do. You're not following like an artistic instinct. So I get upset when there's so many, like somebody, I swear to God, I joined a fucking app called Slasher, which is supposed to be just for horror fans. And all I fucking get on there are people friend requesting me saying, hey, check out my horror podcast where I review horror movies every week. And I'm thinking to myself, why would I give a shit what you think? Like, are you offering me yeah. something new that someone else, yeah. this is good, this is bad. I liked this, I did not like this. Like, I, that's why I wanna, uh, I decided to do this podcast with, with uh, Rainwater. I was like, we're going to do something fucking different. We're going to talk about philosophy of art in different mediums and this and that and kind of talk about how we can help people and techniques and observations, experiences, that kind of thing because it's something – that I didn't see a lot of. I'm not saying it didn't exist, but it's not a lot talked about on the internet. And sure, yeah. maybe we're not as colorful as the people who, you know, do crazy reviews or, you know, play a game or something like that. Maybe it's not as much fun as that, but I feel like we're offering something different. And that was an instinct move on my part, which is why I'm curious to know from you guys. And now I'm coming to the end of my rant. So you guys can talk again. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think? Um, validates an instinct. Like we've talked about, like all of the things that you know make up a person or a you know an artist. Like all of the experiences and things that you've absorbed and stuff that informs yeah. your instinct. Do you think that that works the same for an audience? Yeah, well, what validates an instinct? That's a good question because I think to your earlier point about, you know, what gives people the right to pick up a cell phone and do a TikTok or do like a review or like a thing as art. Have you seen like, uh, what's his face? The Campbell Soup guy, Andy Warhol? Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, I would almost say, what what right does he have but he's considered some kind of legend you know yeah um just for i guess being weird um <laughs> contrary like and i mean there's the whole dadaist movement i mean like you look at like you know um the the urinal piece from the dadaist movement it's like somebody signed a urinal man like 
art is the wild west like you can curate it to a point but a lot of as i've mentioned in previous episodes curation of art is largely a business and world power move it's not an art move right uh, you can you can spin a line of bullshit to validate anything um whether it's good or bad um, spin is absolutely everything. And what validates, as far as validating instinct, though, um, I mean, I think it's a certain degree of experience. But then also, if you're talking about just pure raw instinct, there's like people much younger than me who have had instincts better than some of my trained thoughts and choices have could ever be. And I mean, that's where, you know, you get the prodigies where you're just, you got to defer to them. You got to take your head off and be like, you know what, kid, you got the moxie, you know, like you, you got it. I mean, like, I'm never going to be one of those old poops who just like sits there and, and, oh, these kids and they don't know what's good and blah, blah, blah. And it's yeah. like, you know where that comes from? That comes from a, a place of fear, right? Like it, it, fear of irrelevance, Fear that they're going to overwrite you, that you're closer to your death than your birth, that, you know, somehow you're being made fun of or, you know, ruled out. Or left behind. I think that's a big thing that uh, a a lot of people are in fear of is that they were insignificant in the grand scheme of things. I think that's that plays a big role in it. But here's the thing. And, and you've caught me on a weird date for this because I spent most of today studying Ram Das and um, nice. I guess insignificance is kind of a great place to be in a certain way. Because I think, you know, ego being what it is, it, it's a it's it's a trap kind of Um we're all part of one human race. And as Ram Das likes to say, we're all walking each other home. Um, I like that. Yeah. 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 And I mean, so we're all, and I like to think we're all, we're all the universe experiencing itself. Like one day the universe said, what would it be like if I had a body and I was a bunch of people and like they had different ideas and the universe is big enough to make that fucking shit happen, you know? So here we all are having different ideas And I think that the thing the universe is learning generation after generation is it sucks to have a body. It it really does. I think that's what we're all learning as the universe. Like, um, and I think until we learn that, and I mean, a show I really like that ran too short for me was Midnight Gospel on Netflix. I'll just call that up. Duncan Russell. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I recommend it to anyone who's willing to venture out on kind of a more new wave philosophy, kind of a branch. Rainwater. Have you seen it? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It. yeah. <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was the perfect, it, uh, it was the perfect intersection of like my desire for new agey type stuff and like awesome animation. Some of the best animation I've seen in a couple yeah. years. Well, yeah, it's, it's Titmouse, so, I mean, yeah. they're still in the game, you know? So, like, um, but, I mean, it's, it, for Jow, for the for the uninitiated, it's uh, Duncan Trussell, he's a comedian. He has a podcast, uh, Duncan Trussell Family Hour, I believe it's called, um, where he interviews friends and other comedians about kind of new age, higher philosophy topics. Um, but then Midnight Gospel is he animated a science fiction kind of uh, weirdo, like hallucination world around those interviews. It's kind of like fun with real audio from SNL, if you've seen that, job. Yeah, okay. I'm yeah, where they kind of recontextualize the audio a bit. Um, but, and I had just watched something today. It was the second to last episode where he's with the Grim Reaper. Um, you know, and it, it's it's a thing of learning new lessons right like if if we consider each of our lives as an incarnation which then after we die we if we're going to presuppose we get another incarnation then you know maybe we have more lessons to learn before we join with the one which to me would be the universe right sure so and into i promise i'm gonna tie this back so i know Giles jo- is getting nervous so no, like i'm listening <laughs> So once once we've learned all the lessons, we can go home, right? So each death is like a step toward home, right? So in terms of our instincts and justifying those instincts, 
maybe some of these younger kids have lived more cycles. I don't know. I, I really couldn't prove it either way. But I think ego is stopping us. I think ego is one of those mistakes where it's going to get us the ticket for another go round because we're all walking each other home. Like, I think it's up to us to not gatekeep as much as possible. And it's hard because I have ego too, right? Like I get that burning, like, Whoa, like that, that, like, how dare they come into my room? Yeah. Like kind of thing. But right. I mean, I haven't put out a comic. I've studied narrative for about 15 years or more. And I mean, I can obviously talk a great game, but I haven't actually done anything. So for me to do that would be quite hypocritical. Um, and I think gatekeeping doesn't lead to anything but a new aristocracy that doesn't lead to progress. Um, so I think you can have instincts, and, but it it shouldn't be a, a source of pride to have instincts. I think it's just yeah. a tool. Well, I was going to also kind of going with that topic, Matt. I was going to say people who tend towards more instinctual moves also tend to have less egoistic, yeah. like, you know, impulses, I guess. I they're was... not worried about it. They're not worried about it because the less involved you are with sort of like, oh, am I doing this right or am I doing this wrong? The more you're just going to go, you're going to, quote unquote, go with the flow, basically. Mm -hmm. And... I, I mean, I'm the kind of person who would, I would argue, I would argue for a both and. I think that uh, there's a lot of really great things that comes with that more Zen mindset of like letting go of ego and letting, you know, letting your body, your impulses take their course. And then there's also a lot of great stuff that comes from the mind and what you can apprehend and rationalize in the world. And I tend towards wanting to blend the two together because I like both. I, yeah. I love I love doodling because and I, everybody here, every single person here loves doodling on some level or another because doodling requires the least amount of thought, the least amount of like worrying about am I doing this right or am I doing this wrong? You're just doing it. Yeah. And I think I think at the heart of most people who make art, who create things, that's like that is the center of the core of the heart of that process of creation is that neutral mindset of I just want to do this thing. There's nothing like there's nothing else. All the other stuff comes in from, you know, influencing influence from society, influence from fears, from, you know, all the the maelstrom of just needs and desires and blah, blah, blah. Right. Because that's just yeah. life. Uh, we get we get wrapped up into it, and so you know, each and every one of us here has gone through the process of going to art school, paying an exorbitant amount of money for art school, and then being like, I need to have a job from this thing that I'm doing, right? And then that becomes this like snake eating its own tail of just you know constant worry about, well, will I be able to do the thing? Will I be able to do the thing? When in Reality, all of us began with, I just want to do the thing. Yeah. And I say this also, like, this is a title <laughs> of something that Joe, that Joe has made very recently that has been, that I thought was very uh, impactful for me. You know, it's had a lot of, I've been thinking about it a lot in terms of just, we all want to be actively participating in the world and we don't want to have to worry about whether or not our participation in the world will ever be validated. And so right. that's yeah. that. I, I'm. I don't know if I necessarily have an answer to that first thing that I just said, or a <laughs> further. But I guess I would. I guess I'll pass it on to uh, Joe and ask you. You know, how did um, in re, in in regards to this topic, like, do you have any further thoughts on that? Um, the way you were describing like the doodling thing, um. I feel like what you're getting at is like play is kind of like, like that's the way you're like free, right? Yeah. And so like, say you're trying to write a novel, if you can't get into like that free flow, like doodle, whatever doodling is for a writer, then it's going to be really hard to get any progress because you're going to be like, oh man, am I as good as Stephen King? Uh, I'm worried about my <laughs> plot structure. You know, like you're going to be thinking about all these things that are going to keep you from actually just kind of like just playing with it. Because what 
what it really is is like writing is one thing, but editing is actually where you need to get into where you can do things. And that's the same thing with my doodling too, to where like I doodle all the time. I got in trouble for it in school, like growing up, um, I, and at work they laugh at me in meetings. And it's like I'm try I try to apply that to other things so I can have that freedom to come back to it later and then be like, all right, now I'm a professional and I'm looking at this and I'm going to go with my instinct and do whatever. But if you can't get into that, like, free flow, just fucking off, <laughs> I don't even know how to put it, <laughs> then, like, it, it kind of hinders you. Because, like, I, I wanted to, um, to like, write a lot more and I've been really hung up on it. And that, the thing I sent Rain Order, like, that's probably the first thing I've written besides, like, little short stuff, like comics and stuff and, like, gears. You know? But... There's a way. To... There's ways to doodle as a writer. Uh, that's yeah. mainly what I use my fucking Twitter for most of the time. I will. <laughs> nice. yeah. I will constantly do like dialogue exchanges or or something like that, and I will do it in my like a tweet of like me and my wife because I don't see anybody in real life anymore, and I I will usually try to frame it so that I am the butt of the joke. Like that's mm-hmm. the that's the usual way that I do it because. Most of the time, I mean, granted, I'm making myself look like an like an idiot or an ass, uh, like because some people don't they'll they'll read it on Twitter and assume that it actually happened, whereas it's probably a gross exaggeration of something my wife right. said and then walked into the kitchen and I was like, well, this conversation could have played out differently, and then I you know start doodling a tweet and I throw it out there and it you know it gets the interactions. I look like an ass, but I'd rather have me look like the ass than her. Um, right. especially cause she doesn't have Twitter and she can't negate any of that. But anyway, the, the point is sometimes I will do things like that or I will take snippets of the doodle is in my head as a writer, I guess. Like I will think yeah. of the scenario. I will be like, that yeah. would have been funny if this happened or I should have said that, or this would have been a funny joke or imagine if this happened right at that moment. And those are the things that start getting back cataloged in my brain as doodles Mm -hmm. like writing doodles and then sometimes the ones that stick it's almost going back to instinct the ones that stick almost become instinctual when i'm writing a script i'll be like oh yeah i remember that thing that i thought about that one time when she said that thing let me oh that works perfectly here boom 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 and then it's out there like it becomes a part of something that i'm doing but um i think that what you're talking about with the doodling is very important because it is that's that's pure instinct. Mm-hmm. That's what that is. That's like there there is no restriction, no, no red tape, no fear, nothing. That's what a doodle. That's what the beauty of a doodle, I would say. Yeah, um, because it's action without thought. Yeah, like what you what, were saying. That's Rainwater. how we define instinct. I yeah. guess, best. Yeah. I don't think we can top that. <laughs> I think you <laughs> you fellas have. I think we've got there, boys. Um. Yeah, that's good. Uh, all right, so then we'll wrap it up there. I want to thank Joe Bevel and Matt the Joker Walters for joining me and Mr. Rainwater this week. Thank y'all. Um, great episode, guys. I, I feel like this was, again, I say this almost every episode, but I feel like this is one of our finest episodes. Uh, I don't know when that movie score fucking episode that I teased last week is coming because fucking both Eric Pullman and Diego canceled on me. If you're listening... No shame on you, boys. I love you both. I know you guys are having uh, work issues, but we're going to make that happen. Um, we do have some interesting things coming up. I do want to put it out there that if anyone is listening that would like to be a guest or would like to come on, uh, we are always open, me and Rainwater. You can jump on the the uh, DMs or just an open tweet if you want. Uh, same thing with Instagram. Uh, I'm at the Anjow, T H E A N J O W. Uh, Rainwater, you are at Matthew J Rainwater on both handles, correct? Uh, well, on Twitter it's at Matt J Rainwater, and then on Instagram it's at Matthew Rainwater. That fucking character limit. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you guys can jump into our DMs if you want to uh, jump in and talk about something, or if you have an issue with us and you want us to talk about it, that's fine too. Uh, thank you for listening as always, and we will see you next week. Ba-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da.